Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Product Analytics Meetup. Uh, my name is Anita and I work in Reich, as you can see from my T-shirt. Uh, thank you so much for joining our meetup today. Uh, this meetup is brought to you by Reich Tech Club, which is a community of engineers, product managers and customer Hello, facing product specialists. Uh, uh, my name is Anita and sorry. I work in Reich. There's, there was a problem with my YouTube live. Sorry. Um, so uh, Reich Tech Club is a community of engineers, product managers, and customer facing specialists inside our company, Reich. Uh, we usually run events two to three times a month. Uh, during the time of non-pandemic, we did online, offline meetups. Now we're switching to more like an online format. Uh, and this uh, today we're testing out one of our online meetups in real life. So feel free to ask any questions to our speakers or any questions about Trike you might have. Uh, just write them in the YouTube chat and, and we make sure that every question is answered. Um, also, I really want to ask uh, to all of you out there if you know anything about Trike, and I want to say, please raise your hand, uh, but I can't see your hands right now, so I will tell you about Trike anyways. Uh, Trike is a SaaS-based project management tool for high-performance teams. It's a collaborative tool that is used, for, uh, that is used by more than 20,000 customers all over the world. We have eight offices in the world. Our headquarters are in San Jose, California. Uh, we have two big development offices. The biggest one is in St. Petersburg, Russia. And we recently opened an IT hub office in Prague, Czech Republic. So our meetups are going international day by day and we're running meetups uh, both in English and in Russian. Uh, if you want to follow any of our upcoming events uh, in the nearest future, just feel free to type in Reich Tech Club on meetup.com, Eventbrite, or Timepad, and you'll be uh, receiving all of our links uh, to our YouTube lives and meetups uh, in your email. Um, so today's agenda is uh, product analytics, as I already said, we'll be having three speakers from Reich, from Exola and from Pandora. We'll be having short breaks in between the speeches. Uh, the five minute break will include an interactive activity that I urge you to take part in. It will be a live poll and a cloud word. So all you have to do is just to scan a QR co code and participate in the activity. And as a bonus track at the very end of the meetup, uh, we'll be having a short networking session with a really nice tool that we found, uh, to, uh, thanks to my colleagues. Uh, so feel free to stay up until the very end of the event to test out this tool. And we as a product company really love testing new things and finding the new products. And this one is really fun. I promise you, you'll be having fun and you can also ask any questions in real life to the speakers. Uh, we'll post the link to the networking session uh, at the very end of the, of the event. Uh, also today, my colleague Kate from product analytics team will be helping me with moderating and hosting the meetup. So she'll be asking all of the questions that you guys will uh, write in the YouTube chat. So anytime you want, please uh, ask your question and we'll make sure that it'll, it'll be answered. Also, we have a little bit of time and I'll take it to advertise our upcoming event that will be taking place on May 19th. It will be about product management and we really tried and gathered some top-notch speakers from Reich, from Product Board and from Mira. So if product management is something that really uh, plays into you, uh, feel free to join our event. It's absolutely free. Uh, just make sure you follow us on meetup.com, Eventbrite, or on Timepad. We'll post the link to the meetup as well. So I think we are ready to get started. Our first speaker is my colleague, uh, Kirill Schmidt. Uh, he is a senior product analyst in Reich, and he'll be talking about reproducible research today. Kirill, if you're ready, please tune in, and we're ready to listen to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, can you hear me? Everything is okay? Yes. I want to share my screen. Uh, okay. So uh, today I'm going to talk about reproducible research. Um, and as Anita said, I'm uh, Kirill Schmidt, uh, senior analyst at Reich. And um, I want to discuss this topic because 
uh, it's kind of cornerstone in work of the analyst. So have you ever encountered a problem that you actually can't repeat work you have, that you have done a couple of months ago because data or is lost or maybe uh, process is too complicated and you can't uh, make it uh, again in the same way. So you uh, can get same numbers in your reports uh, and uh, that's kind of frustrating because you can't even be sure that everything was done correct uh, in previous uh, research. And uh, how can be assured that your next research will be correct too. So, uh, first of all, a couple of words about me. I'm senior analyst at Reich, and uh, I work in analytics for more than seven years. I worked in different industries. I joined to the Reich team recently, uh, a couple of months. And uh, I worked in medicine, in banking software, uh, at, at networks, and uh, now I'm working in project management too. And also I'm leader of uh, community, SPB, uh, St. Petersburg Business Intelligence uh, Community, where we discuss similar problem, uh, but generally offline in uh, our city. Uh, so what's, what is the main job of the product analyst at Reich? Uh, product analyst at Reich, like uh, right hand of the product manager. So we are very focused on uh, understanding clients need, our customers needs, uh, how they use our product, uh, what, what we can do better for them. And product, as product analysts, product managers is people who actually drive uh, products. Uh, but if they want to understand what's happening, they uh, usually need help of, uh, of us, of product analysts. So we uh, help them to understand needs, to find relevant metrics, uh, how to actually measure what we do and uh, actually understand have we uh, done everything good or maybe we made some mistakes or maybe we need to do this action so that instead of something other actions and we perform a b testing uh, to uh, ensure that uh, everything that, that actually things that we have done uh, influence uh, and effect of uh, of clients behavior um, but as a product analyst, uh, we work, we actually try to find out uh, truths about client's behavior. So some kind of objective truths. And in this sense, we work as a kind of scientist. Uh, we, uh, they do the same way. They try to find objective truths about nature. And uh, we as a product analyst try to find uh, objective truths of client's behavior. And we share same methodology with scientists uh, in this way. Uh, now it's very popular uh, among product managers, hypothesis testing. So we are want to uh, formulate some, some kind of idea and then test it, uh, does it really our clients uh, like it or is this hypothesis right or wrong? And uh, this corresponds to the second idea of the scientific method that uh, our hypothesis, hypothesis should be falsifiable. Uh, and eventually we need to understand is our idea correct or wrong? Uh, it can be, we shouldn't generate ideas which can be proven wrong. Uh, third idea of uh, scientific method is that we need to pass peer review so other people uh, can see what we have done we can we should discuss it so we can find problems and we should develop our understanding of the uh, objective truths reality or uh, our uh, needs of our customers uh, so we can gradually develop understanding uh, as it happens in science and uh, one of the one of the important point is that we actually need to be able to repeat this uh, many times and uh, get the same conclusions. So we have same amount of data. Uh, if we have a uh, starting amount of data, we need to get to the same conclusions. Uh, and this conclusion shouldn't depend on the researcher who actually performed the research. Otherwise, uh, we actually seeing uh, re results of research interpretation rather than objective true. So reproducibility is, is this uh, a way to fight against subjectivity of the researcher. 
And also it's a, it's a way to be ensured that everything was done correct. So peer review can be effectively, uh, effectively performed because you can see actually on the process how research was done. And uh, this uh, reproducibility, despite the fact that uh, many work of the analyst looks like scientific work, actually it's performed in a slightly different way. Uh, so I want to describe my example from my, uh, from my experience. Uh, then I was young analyst. Uh, I mostly work in Excel actually to perform all the uh, analytical duties to transform data. And uh, one of my uh, requests from the stakeholders was about performing uh, churn ana analytics of the clients. I worked for uh, banking software company, which developed uh, software for prepaid cards and uh, developed this product. And my task was to find, to analyze churn rates for clients with, uh, who had mobile application, who uh, meet some kind of, sort of threshold of monthly turnover and who, have, uh, who had uh, credit products on their prepaid cards. So actually to do this, uh, the typical steps of this procedure is to gather data from different resources and uh, different, different sources. And these sources wasn't organized in nice and tidy database. It was uh, spread across the company. So I actually need to gather different files from different places, then uh, ask for the data from different people. Then I need to hard process them in Excel. So I need to shuffle some cells between each other to uh, create some formulas, calculate uh, many things in a manual way uh, to actually join all the data and pre-process it, with, uh, filter uh, clients which I need for the research and uh, uh, build up, eventually build up report as an email which I uh, sent to my stakeholders Email, in this email, I copy and paste data from, the, from my uh, data sources and my, my prepared data sources. Uh, copy and paste all, all the graphics and eventually uh, we, uh, we discuss the results with the stakeholders. So that's, that's a typical process of ad hoc research, uh, but still it's, it's already very laborious. It uh, took lots of effort actually to do so. Uh, and um, and then we, after after review, we just, we uh, find out that we not we need to go deeper and uh, modify uh, some details in in this research. And here we come to the big problem because actually to modify all this work it's a huge huge problem uh, because it was done in Excel. It's very hard to actually replicate all the steps which was done to achieve the result. And uh, even if I can can repeat it, uh, it would take um, uh, lots of boring and uh, routine work to rebuild the report and to rewrite all the conclusions, uh, even if I change very small uh, amount of uh, data and if, if I change, if I if focus of my research changed really slightly. So uh, the issue arises with the reproducibility arises, uh, then you need to modify or extend your research which was already done. Then you need to recheck uh, your data or conclusions. Then somebody point out for some kind of problem inconsistency or maybe uh, two unexpected numbers in your reports and researchers. Uh, then you need to return to your research done uh, a couple of months ago, and then you uh, forgot how to do, how, how it was done. Uh, you have a bunch of files, uh, a bunch of data, a bunch of reports, but you do not have actual links and connection, how to work through it from the beginning to the end. And uh, actually it's hard to perform peer review. So other colleagues, it's hard for other colleagues uh, go deep into your research. They can read your report, but it's hard for them to uh, go through all, of, through all of your steps of the data preparation and uh, data modification, which lead to your uh, report and to your conclusion. So your peer review can be uh, really deep. Uh, and uh, it's mean that quality of peer review can be not so great. So how can we address this problem? Oh, uh, and uh, also all this lead to cost to organization. So uh, I described routine, I described this overhead that you need to do 
uh, additional work just to figure out what what was done a couple of months ago it may lead to inconsistency to into your rep reports then uh, same stuff done in different way it uh, produced different numbers and different numbers in final conclusions and reports may lead to distrust to the analytics from uh, stakeholders uh, point of view because they think that you always do some mistakes but maybe you don't do any uh, any mistakes just you just have shifting methodology uh, and if you have distrust in analytics that mean that uh, your analytics isn't working uh, for your company at all because no one use it for actual uh, decision making how can we address this problem so i think that uh, here we have two two ideas uh, first of all we need to tune yourself on special mindset about our work and uh, when we actually can implement uh, some principles to actually do our work in more reproducible way. Uh, the mindset, it's about think about your work uh, as independent as work independent from from the researcher. So uh, like you are doing it, uh, not uh, like it's work, uh, which is done uh, by abstract researcher. So it should be uh, repeated without you, and it should be uh, should be able to uh, understand it by other people. So you need to start build up your research in this way from the beginning, uh, and uh, this lead to ideas that you don't you shouldn't use some kind of magic numbers or maybe some kind of transformation which other people can't understand and only you can understand. And this this also mean that you should uh follow some kind of uh ideas in your uh work process and uh, what what's what's the ideas we can implement in our research to actually ensure that we have reproducible research the first idea and first principle is that uh, we should try to do everything in code uh, it begins from uh, extracting of data first of all try to use uh, formal queries to actually extract data uh, and uh, save them in your uh, research folder. For example, for, for my analytical experience, uh, for, for this case with churn rate analysis, I should uh, give the data in, uh, I should store it in some, uh, I should give the data through the SQL queries wherever possible and save this uh, in the folder. Also, it is very valuable to store your uh, ETL transformations which you perform on your own data which you received as a script too. So uh, anyone can repeat it again uh, because uh, these scripts actually represents what you have done with your data uh, e rather than uh, words which you can uh, write in your research as description over your data transformation. And uh, also it's a good idea to generate all your outputs and graphs for, for your research uh, in, in code. So you can regenerate them if uh, something, if you need to change something and if someone wants to repeat your work. Uh, so uh, I want to show you example of this uh, organization uh, of files and all in code procedure principle. So uh, here we have uh, here we have uh, example of the research project, uh, which organized uh, in a way that every step is stored in uh, as a script. So here we have SQL file which extract data from the databases. Uh, this script uh, downloads data uh, to to, to this local machine because it's more convenient for this research to store this data locally. It's a small amount of data and uh, it's easy to handle this in this way. And uh, here we have a file which actually generate, uh, this file perform ETL transformation of the data and uh, generate final report. And uh, here we have final report which I can send to the stakeholders. So everything from the beginning to the end uh, done by these files and if I want to modify something I can just modify these files and every step 
so if I uh, if I save all these files, then I won't lose any step of uh, creation of the report, and it will be reproducible. Um, but we also have a couple of other ideas. Um, uh, still, if you if you do everything in code, you will get to to some level of reproducibility. But you also should ensure uh, other things uh, in the work process. And, and uh, second principle is use version control for for your code. So if you created code, and then uh, it's good idea to actually store it uh, as it, as if it was a program, like uh, it's uh, done by professional programmers. So use GitHub and use uh, version control because it gives you ability to store your master version of your research, and you can always uh, you can modify this research in controlled way because uh, version control system don't allow you accidentally to break your master version. Uh, it uh, allows you to change history of, uh, allows to trace uh, history, change of the history change of the uh, researchers. Uh, it provides you with backup version if you accidentally destroy your code on your local file or local system. And uh, one of the advice, uh, do not store data in uh, repository because you don't need it actually, uh, because you, need to, you can regenerate it uh, using your code. So you don't need to store it in a uh, version control system. Uh, so code version control greatly helps you to uh, organize your work in reproducible manner. Uh, so, other other idea is that uh, third principle is about data control. Uh, but despite the fact that we, uh, that I don't recommend you to store data in version control system because it's not for it, but uh, you need to be ensured that you get same data uh, every time you you performing your report. So you can so you should explicitly control things which uh, depends on data. On date, um, for example, you may uh, obvious example is date range. Uh, then you get data from starting from this period to through this period. Uh, very often we use something like more than. Uh, very often in scripts we use something like uh, give me all data before January first, twenty twenty. But this approach will lead us to situation when rerun of your report will generate different data just because you have different period in your uh, results of your queries. So it's better to uh, explicitly control data ranges in your scripts and control of, the, of all variables which have time dependency. So which can, uh, if you use some kind of current situation, then it's usually a good idea to save uh, date of uh, report generation explicitly in your uh, in your scripts. And uh, next idea is that you shouldn't depend your research on your locally saved data because this will present huge problem for other people to reproduce it because they don't, they won't have your data uh, and you need to move it to them or I, but you can also lose, lose it because it's stored on your, um, on your local machine. And you should be able to regenerate your data from uh, from your queries, but sometimes uh, we do not have this ability because I don't know because we got our files from different sources, not from our databases, because someone sent us this report or uh, data source. Uh, and it's a great idea to actually store them at least in cloud, something like uh, Google Drive, or if you can put it into database, uh, and then put it into the database so it can be backed by uh, database procedures. Uh, and fourth principle is integrated reports. So integrated reports is uh, notebooks. One of the example of the integrated reports is uh, Air Notebook or Jupyter Notebook, which allows you to write reports and code uh, in same file. 
So their features is ability to hide to hide code from reader. So you can actually have code in the file, but you can, you can hide it if you don't want to show it to the to the reader. Uh, you can write if you use integrate report. You can write your research as a story. Uh, so you write words uh, about your research, and then you want, you decided to make some back and forth investigation of your data, and you can do it right uh, in your report, just as a, a bunch of code, and then you figure out what you need to show, uh, and then you can pr continue to write words about your report. So you're like you are writing story from the beginning to the end. You do not create your research and your conclusion separately. You create as a, a wow, wow, one unit. Also, it allows you to perform inline calculations and insert actual numbers in text. So if you're calculating some, some kind of, you may create some kind of um, string in which you're saying our convention rate uh, for this experiment is, and then put number which is actually calculated from the data from your research. And if you uh, modify it in some way, this number will be recalculated for, for your integrated report. So this small adjustment uh, would automatically uh, change your output. So and also integrated reports allows you to show and <clears throat> print graphs based on data in the same way as inline calculation. Uh, you can control your output format. You can put it, you, you may create PDF files or HTML files or something different if you want. Uh, and uh, so you can separate your, you just can send to the stakeholders final report and uh, simultaneously save uh, all the prerequisites to reproduce it uh, for, for the different peers or for some modification for the future. Um, well, in this sense, I prefer Air Notebook uh, can, rather than Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Notebook because it stores because it's store, stored as a plain text rather than a HTML code. Uh, but you can do all this stuff with Jupyter Notebook too. And I want to show an example of this uh, with Air Notebook. So here we have uh, here we have actually integrated report uh, in Air Studio. Uh, so here, here we have uh, title. Uh, Air Markdown is used to write main text and to modify it. Here we, sell, we have cell code and its output as a graph. Uh, and uh, so continues, the, it's continuing, it's just a report. And eventually I can uh, transform it to the HTML file. So here is the example. So this is the code in IDEA, and he, this is the output for the reader. So I don't have this part with the code. I just have text, which is uh, formatted in a, in a way uh, which is consumable by the reader. And I have graphs, which gener generated from the code uh, inside the integrated report. And I can send this, I can send this to the stakeholder, and this file uh, can be saved uh, into version control system. So, to back to the so summary of the four principles for reproducible research. We should use uh, we should uh, write everything in code. Uh, we should use version control. We should control our data and we should uh, use integrated reports to generate our uh, results to stakeholders. And if we talk about workflow, how to, what, how will be uh, organized everyday research with this, uh, with this four principle. So you will begin from uh, version control system. So first of all, you try to synchronize your master version with the cloud version control. Then you create you, your, no, your uh, own branch of the, uh, so you can write new research and uh, don't mess up with the master version. Uh, then you write your SQL files for data extractions, uh, some scripts for data download and ETL. Uh, then you start to write your uh, integrated report. 
and uh, generate event, gen eventually generate report for stakeholders, push and commit your code to the version control system and uh, send generated report to stakeholders. So in this way, you will get everything stored in a reproducible way and uh, eventually you completed the tasks which was asked uh, from you by your stakeholders. So thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer your questions. So hi, I'm Kate. <laughs> I'm product analyst at RIC2 and uh, today I will present questions to our speakers. So um, I want you to ask to join us in our QA live sessions that you can find like on the right sidebar near the video stream. Uh, so and unfortunately, we don't have like a lot of time for questions, but I see one question. And it's from Sergey. And uh, he asked, uh, how do you send HTML reports to your stakeholders? And uh, probably I can uh, like add my own question to it. Like, isn't it uh, complicated for stakeholders to read your report like with code? So, so the main idea is the is stakeholder actually see this thing. Uh, so, so it's. Um, uh, yeah, this thing. So it's just. It's just document, so there is no code. It's just uh, report, uh, and it's it's this variant is uh, needed to the HTML format. So for them, any browser can open it, but uh, I can uh, alter result as a PDF, uh, so they can read it as a PDF file. Uh, I haven't experimented with different formats, but uh, I can need it to Windows documents. Uh, and I think in, G in Google Documents format too. So actual output is uh, it's variable uh, to your particular needs. So the main idea is there is no code for stakeholders. They don't need to, be, to see it. Uh, you can always hide it. Uh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, and we have like a time for another question. So uh, a question from Alexander. Uh, like ETL realized through standard, uh, sorry, DPLYR library. Sorry, I don't know exactly <laughs> this library. So probably um, maybe you can tell us more about uh, ETL protests. So, well, Deplier, I think it's a library for uh, for R. I prefer that table, uh, actually. Uh, well. So yeah, I think that how we actually can transform data using R or Python is a topic for just for other discussion. So how, how can we use these instruments like Python and R to simplify work of the analysts? Uh, just another topic. So, but eventually, yeah, you can uh, transform, do many things in uh, R or Python script uh, and uh, in many cases, it's more simpler to do it in, in uh, R or Python rather than uh, SQL. Because in R, you can, you can have cycles, you can have step-by-step uh, -step execution, uh, but in SQL, you need to perform your transformation as one, uh, as a, as a one, uh, in one go uh, most of the time. But on the other hand, uh, if you have heavy, heavy computation, it's preferable to do them in, in, on database engine rather than your uh, Python, rather than machine with, your, with Python or with R. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the last question, why do you prefer Python? And probably is there the same way to prepare the same kind of report, but for Python? And why, why do you prefer R? Sorry. R, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no um, well, maybe I prefer R because I was brought into uh, this script analytics uh, through the scientific community, and they prefer R more uh, over over the Python. And uh, I think, uh, in my, I think that I'm biased in this way, but I think that it's more, it's done for, it's better for analytical purposes because everything is 
like constructed for you uh, as a in the beginning uh, in the in the minds of the creator of the language uh, so but in terms of actual abilities uh, i think that they are the same so that's, that's just different of preference between the two different languages and yes you can do every uh, the same uh, you can perform same idea uh, with python actually you have jupyter notebook which uh, do do the same you have you have uh, code you have you have text which can be uh, edited with markdown and you have uh, Jupyter notebook cells, which can which can have code and can be calculated and uh, draw the results. And uh, as I remember, you can hide the code from the users. Uh, so and but also also I have another uh, experience in I can use both languages in integrated report. So I have uh, uh, I created report which. Uh, download and transform data using data table and R language and then perform uh, natural language processing with an LTK and scikit-learn libraries from Python and, and all this stuff done in one document. So it's an interesting idea just to combine uh, best things from the both languages. Mm -hmm. Th thank you very much for your answer. Um, unfortunately, we run out of time, but I just want to say that you can continue to ask your questions and uh, Kirill will answer them, but uh, just not personally, probably just in comments. So, and uh, for now we have like five minutes break and then we will return to our translation and uh, continue our meetup. So. Thank you. Thank you everyone, goodbye.
And we are coming back. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Alexander Tolmachov from Exola. Uh, Sasha, I think you can uh, tune in into our YouTube live and to uh, unmute your video and show yourself. Um, Sasha will be talking about uh, their own tool that they created inside of their company. Um, and he will be talking about how to get data insights in uh, using this tool. So Sasha, I give floor to you. You can unmute and start your speech. Hello, everyone. Uh, for now, I want to show you our tool, which we developed in our company. And uh, for now, it is internal tool, but we think about develop it as an open source tool. Uh, now I will start demonstrate our screen. Okay, we call the service uh, like Data Insider, and uh, I will tell you about this. Mm. First of all, I want to tell you about our company, Exola is a video game business engine and uh, we set our solutions to help game developers and game publishers to grow their business. We work with enterprise partners and indie partners, um, enterprise partners like as Twitch, Steam, PUBG, and uh, you can see some of them on the screen. Uh, what we doing? We increase revenue for our partners by creating consistent sales experience from alpha to post launch, expand uh, payment footprint, build uh, some anti-fraud tools to protect your business, grow an audience by building marketing campaigns and work with influencers. And also we get funding to new projects to get access to build their own dream project. Also, I want to tell you about myself. I'm head of data science in this company. And also I mm, speaker of Highload and PyCon conferences. Uh, and also work with some kind of, uh, I don't know, mm, non-typical uh, high school of economics uh, education for students. Mm. What is Data Insider? Uh, Data Insider is acceleration of research, allows you to identify essential significant points for research forester. Uh, quick answers for business opportunities simply define data analysts need to define data set to experiment. Then you can get results within 10 minutes. If you want, you can explore more complex relationship with additional methods if you need. Um, for example, you can just define a data set for experiment and find which factors are important to target value. Uh, first, let's talk about um, data analyst work cycle. Uh, what we are typically doing, we build some hypotheses, make some actions on data, build some insights, and uh, make our business grown up. Uh, we control metrics, we find some problem cases, and want to improve statistics of our business revenue grown up. Uh, what we're doing? Get data, connectors, join filters, spreadsheet databases, external services, we find insights, we think what is important or not, find some good story in data, think about data set, think about categorical features, numeric features, find some anomalies. Um, after that, we plan our experiment, talk with our colleagues, find what matter in data. And after that, we start our action. Uh, typically, we code on Python or R, we build some pipeline to pre-process data, collect data, build some analysis model, make some start experiments. And after it, we make a report to our business heads or product owners 
to make next steps for our business. Uh, what I think is the main problem of every analyst work. As you can see, uh, it is a typical time planning of every analyst task. Um, first of all, we check some problem which we have after it. We want to analyze sources and collect some data to find what is matter or not. After it, we develop some MVP algorithm. And uh, you can see that analyzing the sources, it is the main point of each data analyst work. Um, we can speed up this step and make analytics more effective. If we reduce the time allotted from 60 to 30%, we will spend up the research in all typical tasks in the analyst day. Mm, and it will be good because our business partners, business heads, product owners can make some experiments with data, can find some insights much faster. Mm, why this problem? Uh, why we have this problem? First of all, we all have a good education and we know that data is not good. The data is dirty. We need to pre-processing data. We need to find some good, good tools to um, analyze it. We can find some new correlations. We can find some anomalies. We need to group data. We need to calculate um, business value from data. We need to collect from different sources. Uh, and if you know, we spend it a lot of time. Mm. First of all, we need to speed up our experiments. Uh, what we need to do to make our experiments faster. We need some mm, more powerful tool for our data analyst, which all of them can use. We need to automate our regular work and uh, make a typical pipeline to pre-process data, uh, find insights and help us to make our work steps faster. We need that our results must be stable because we need to um, understand these results and generate some good reports to our business heads. Uh, what we need to do, we need should be easily, we need that data will be should easily to understand for business units and every report is the same structure. If we do this, we can make a good service that speed up our research. Uh, what is the main concept um, of the data insider framework? Uh, data insider framework, understanding our data and weighting the importance for business. We can program an algorithm that will help us. Uh, and uh, the concept is to automate data analysis, transformation, conclusion, take it into account weighting on business metric. We can define a main flow, what we doing with our data. Uh, we have two typical types of data, categorical and numeric features, and we all doing the same things with them. We know that if we know analyze categorical features, we need to binarization it, we need to group some mm, numeric statistic of it. Uh, what we're doing with numerical statistics, we find some averages, we calculate some quantities, and uh, it is typical work type for every specialist. After it, we need to find some, some groups in our data set, uh, which is important to our business. Uh, how we can do this? We can build a binarization model of every data which we use. After it, we can calculate every group importance to target business value. If we can calculate importance of our groups, we can calculate total shape and possible effect for our business in these groups. And then if we can calculate business effect in our groups in data set, we can make some reports with recommendations to do next steps. I want to show you some um, business case. It is a typical business test for data analyst. 
it is a real task in our previous days. Uh, business detect that we have our partner service is a Twitch. Twitch subscription began to grow sharply. Uh, we need to know what happened because it is important to our business and it is important to our partner. If we can identify the case, we can um, analyze it and we can find that there can be some problem. Maybe it is a fraud. Maybe it is some technical problem because it is not typical um, behavior of this metric. We have metric, active subscriptions, and it is grow up. Why is important? Uh, we, as a service expert with analytics for our partners, we must um, see everything, what doing our partners, what do the player in the games, and we can find some good expertise in this, and give some feedback to our partners to, um, to grow the armor. Uh, open detection of atypical cases, we protect partners from fraud, malfunctions, help find the cases and improve their business. How work with service? Uh, we work with categorical and numeric features. First of all, I want to tell you about numeric features. Uh, numeric features, methodology based on um, old financial institute methodology, weight of evidence and important value. I have a link to the methodology. If you want to research it, I can share it you after the presentation. You can type me after it. Uh, we modify this methodology to our business and uh, it seems to be typical for every business Mm. The main position of this methodology that we can group numeric features to important some groups with um, main statistical features that will be um, described all data set. Uh, this is work because uh, important variance method weights every uh, grouped factor to all data set and uh, find the most important borders to each group to make um, more important variants to, to all data set. For example, you have some typical numeric feature. For example, subscription revenue year plan in this task. Uh, you can plot some graphs, you can find that distribution of this value is something like uh, left on the left on the screen, and uh, it have maybe some normal distribution, but we have that uh, we have um, some kind of interesting cases on the left and some kind of the long tail on the right. Uh, after the um, use this methodology on this data, we find that there are three typical groups. You can find it on the right side on the screen. With the resulting transformation, we obtain statistically stable conclusion in these samples. You can find that uh, this group have uh, borders from teal and size to the old data set. Sorry, how it works with categorical feature. The categorical feature is a typical machine learning preprocessing. As you know, some kind of one hot encoder. Uh, it typical uh, make a binary columns to every unique value of this feature. And, uh, mm, but not the same, because if you know one hot encoder uh, make every binary, every column to every unique value. Even this value is less to all shape of the data. Uh, we modify the one hot encoder methodology and uh, we group small size of subgroup to same group uh, if it less than 5% and make um, 
synthetical subgroups of small groups. For example, if you have some kind of examples with groups of shape 3%, 4%, 2%, 1%, it will define in two subgroups with 5% and 4%. How it works in total? Uh, you build a binarization model. Mm, it is sim similar to one hot encoder, as I say, but it's different. You can see that we have some mm, numeric features on the left side of the screen, like average revenue. We have some numeric feature like water, and we have categorical feature is uh, country, country code. If we use one hot encoder, we get uh, only country ISO and we get small size of the subgroups because of one hot encoder not work with numeric features. And uh, as I say, split to binary columns, every small subgroups on each categorical factor. Uh, our model built, as I say before, uh, statistical weighted groups and and you can see that we have quarter one, quantity, some non-typical group number one, and uh, binarization group with borders from three to 125 average revenue as some kind of statically important group and uh, some typical categorical group um, from country. After we have binarization model, we need to find uh, how these subgroups really important to our business target. Uh, an assessment of the importance of the groups is shown on this formula. Uh, we estimate the volume of deviation of average in the subsample from the general aggregation. At the same time, we understand that in different business tasks, the significance of the volume or influence is different. Using the better parameter, we can control uh, what important for us in this task. For example, we can find that some biggest group um, can um, change something by 1%, but it is really simple. Uh, but change something by 50%, but small kind, small size for subgroup, it is much harder. And we can um, manipulate the beta parameter as hyperparameter of the model. Default beta is one. Uh, default, each data analyst, when built experiment, junior or senior can define uh, their own beta parameter. But most of all, uh, we find that better parameter with one is uh, mm, better for much cases in our business. Maybe in your business, it will be the same. In the business result, uh, I want to show you what we find. Mm, the found insight is formed over the only one game uh, that have mm, a lot of influencer in a small period. We found it was some kind of game named Valorant uh, and influencer in this game get extra viewers. Uh, you can see it at the uh, uh, right graph. Mm, you can see that in the same dates, mm, count of viewers mm, grown mm, sharply. Detailing a uh, case found less than 20 minutes. Uh, detailing a case with a business head is the next long stage, but uh, it is not a target to this system because uh, we found good insight to talk with our business head. Uh, and he is agree that it is really important. We talk with them that it is really important and make some next steps to find uh, why this happened because it's not normal behavior and we start talk with Twitch and make next steps. Uh, why is this important for us? 
we can quickly find insights in next few days and uh, find uh, which um, solution help our partners or our business grow up. Uh, why is it simple? Uh, the simplicity of the code uh, showed on the right side on screen. Any employee in the company can copy from the repository uh, and uh, use it in their own local notebook with um, less than 10 rows of code. Uh, we use a single code and this we use a single code and this speeds up to phobia of collects, as you can see, use the normal Python library. The documentation is being developed jointly with collects, and we try to make sure that the service is possible to use to junior data analyst and senior data analyst will be helpful. Uh, and it is open repository. We um, share our knowledge on this repository. We build some new methods and every of colleagues can make a commit and uh, some senior um, level data analyst can check it. And if it will be helpful, we talk about it and merge it to master. Uh, junior data analyst can use the main flow of the system. He can write a 10 rows of code, get result, get main point to grow up, uh, make a fast report, make a fast insight or build new experiment and make next step. Uh, what is important to senior specialist? Senior specialist need to go deeper. He want to find some good insights. He want to make some strongly experiment and uh, we know about it and we build some objects in this library and uh, mm, we give the total mm, value of this methodology in hands of specialist. Mm, data analyst specialist can improve the, their knowledge or share it through the refinement of the service. This significantly ex increases the cross-functional interception of collects because we have the product approach. Each specialist make a commit, as I say, which will be validated as possible specialist. Uh, and also, I want to say, show you some business cases, what we find with this experiment. Uh, we build experiment and want to find uh, what a main point, uh, what um, make a grown up active subscriptions. But we find also that uh some not typical cases we find that trial period with month duration is the worst for our partners to their revenue we find that the most mm, good period to make a trial period for the game or some mm, game service like twitch is between three and 30 days mm. we look at that mm, more detail and find that the most the best period for trial is two weeks and uh, after it we make a report calc the possible business grown and calc that if set uh, if our partners set trial period by two weeks we have month trial period the revenue will grow up till 30 percent 13 percent uh, another case we find that uh, also uh, we use um, a factor as a day of the month. We collect data set as each payment of each partner of uh, each day uh, at, at last, uh, as I remember, one and a half year, and uh, we make a statistic. After it, Model say us she find that uh, in country Saudi Arabia uh, worst uh, day it is a tenth day of the month. Uh, if um, every partner 
um, in Saudi Arabia. We don't know what <laughs> what happened in Saudi Arabia, and now we look at it. But we thought that if um, our partners who work in Saudi Arabia we work with 10th day of the month, um, it will increase their revenue by 5%. What we have done in total, we research and calc that our data research speed up at, uh, and uh, we built for now at first month, 20 plus research in our company. Uh, and I think it is a good result for not big, uh, for not big um, team in our company because we have uh, four specialists uh, in data analysis. We plan uh, at Q2 as a target for data science team to improve system quality and representation. Uh, and also, we have to think that we need to build an open source Python library for data science community and uh, open data science at Q3. Uh, and also, we have start to develop interface to regular users because not only data analysts want to work with this data. We know that our um, product owners, uh, business analysts want to work with their data and build simple experiments fast. And uh, for now, we start to develop interface to regular users. And uh, for now, I want to say thank you all. And also, if you want to be a part of our open source library, you can type me on email on or in Telegram. And uh, we talk about it because uh, we can build the service faster. Thank you. So Alexander, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I just uh, a quick reminder that you can ask your question uh, in Q&A live session me as a video stream so and uh, just uh, one simple question from me uh, you said a lot about um, uh, ETL process that you like uh, spend a lot of time on this and uh, just my question what is about feature engineering and how much time do you spend on this uh, we have um, we have backlog of the system and we have some points to build some synthetical features, polynomial features and others. And uh, for now, we have uh, mm, this side of work mm, belong to data analyst. Data analyst as expert need to research the data and uh, define the first data set to the model. After it, model says what important or what not. And after it, data analyst can make a quick research to next step and uh, improve the data set to next step of research. Yeah, okay. So we have another question. Uh, so you said quite a lot about one hot encoding. And uh, the question from, uh, sorry, Bobby, I don't know. <laughs> uh, what other approaches uh, do you use uh, when you analyze the data? And maybe I will like add to this question. Uh, maybe you can tell us more about the algorithm that um, help you to combine like different binary columns. So maybe you can like tell more about it. Uh, the main point that um, I can share a link. It is a very simple algorithm. Um, I, um, if you search, if you can search uh, the weight of evidence in scoring cards, uh, it will answer to your question because uh, the main formulas I show you in the presentation that the main of this algorithm that we um, we calculate count of good cases till uh, to bad cases in groups 
first of all, count of groups set randomatically and uh, good cases, it was when uh, it is where average of target value in this group better than uh, average target value in all data set. Uh, and it is simple and uh, it is very simple and clever. Uh, what is the better? Better is when uh, you have average in your subgroup better than average in all data set. What is the worst? Worst it is when average in your subgroup uh, worse in than uh, average target value in all data set. And after it, um, then you rand randomly um, make some splits. Uh, you need to build some uh, um, one-sided uh, trend line. Uh, if you if you do not have local extremes in your trend line uh, by your positions by your groups, uh, you build uh, right uh, boy groups. Uh, if you have some local extremes on these uh, groups. Uh, this build not good and uh, important evidence uh, says you that uh, this group not statically matter and if you will make uh, some kind of um, data analysis results on this it will be um, not statically um, consistently uh, it can change in the future Thank you very much. So uh, unfortunately we run out of time. So probably you can just answer your question uh, in the comments. And uh, I just uh, want to, to ask you to join us in our slider. You can answer our questions. And now we'll have like five minutes break and then we will continue with uh, another speaker. So don't go. Thank you a lot.
and we are coming back to our meetup. And since it's coming a little bit to an end, uh, I want to urge you to fill in our feedback form. The link to the feedback form you can find in the description to this video. It will make it will help us to make our meetups better in the future. So feel free to share any of your thoughts or rate our speakers' uh, talks. Uh, also, at the very end, this uh, form will be available as a QR code, so you can scan it anytime. Just please fill in the form so we can know what we can do better next time. And our last speaker for today is Tanya Tandon. Tanya works in Pandora, which is an American company, a music stream company. She'll be sharing her best practices on how to uh, talk with different stakeholders and how to interact with different departments within the company. Uh, so Tanya, feel free to join and we're ready to listen to you. everyone can you see me okay okay i'm gonna go ahead assuming you guys can see me correctly um i'm gonna share my screen let me know if you cannot see it okay uh, anita let me know that all's good so i'm gonna go ahead uh hi everyone i'm actually gonna pivot from what i thought i'll be initially speaking on overall it's gonna cover the same things but it's gonna cover a little more than just the stakeholder part and you'll see why so what i'll be speaking on today is being an effective product analyst and is being a great analyst enough and i'm tanya tandon uh to begin with, uh, this is about me. Of course, to explain myself or to introduce myself, I had to use a Venn diagram because we are nerds like that. Um, I love data science, I love adventure sports, and I love art. And I grew up to be that kid who loved card games and who used to count cards, um, who loved calculating probability in any board game I've ever played. And I play a lot of strategy board games and I'm uh, happy to have a conversation about that, but that's how I like to introduce myself. A little more about my education and my formal work. So I did my undergrad at st in statistics uh, from a college in India called Kirodimal, Delhi University. And then I worked for a year in a consulting firm, which is a blockchain consulting firm. And I did a little bit of product management, a little bit of data science work. And I realized that I have a strong passion for data science. And I wanted to learn in depth about what tools to use and what are the best practices and everything uh, within that. So I started my master's uh, from Northwestern. Uh, I did the uh, master's of science and analytics from Northwestern. And it was a really, really good experience. Um, I think it's one of the best things I've ever done in my life because of multiple reasons, which is again a topic for another discussion. So I'd like to get into what I'm currently doing. So currently, as Anita mentioned, I am a product analyst at Pandora, uh, where currently uh, I work on, I own podcast, which means that I have certain stakeholders, which, are, which I'll be explaining in more depth further. Uh, but I have served a lot of stakeholders uh, that I've worked with in podcast and every uh, effect and every decision that need that are needed to be made in podcast uh, sort of goes through me. Uh, so that is what I do. I also do other stuff uh, like I work on retention, I work on certain playlists and stuff like that, but podcast is my main focus. The other thing that I'm working on right now is a Delta Fellowship. Um, where uh, it, it's a consulting company, but for NGOs. So we build a machine learning solution for NGOs and I'm volunteering here and I'm helping a company called Tarjumli, which helps um, language solutions and helps refugees to overcome language barriers. Uh, so I'm working as an ML solution consultant for them. So those are the top two projects that I am part of. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about my internship uh, when I first started working at Pandora. And I think uh, that in ways has transformed how I view my current job and how I approach my current job. So I think I'd like to begin by that. 
so during my internship i was told that uh, i my problem for the summer is how does repetition affect our listener base and this is a really broad problem and it is a complicated problem because if you think about a music streaming service uh, repetition could be different in a lot of ways it could be different for different genre different music artists different song repetition is also very different for a younger person than an older person it can also be different state wise and a lot of these things so i did what an analyst would do when given with the problem i inquired the problem i met with a bunch of stakeholders i inquired the problem then i built hypotheses on what to do about it how do i define it because defining repetition in itself is a difficult problem uh third uh, i built uh, a bunch of metrics and a bunch of proxies uh, because again repetition is not some inherently measured in an app so you have built proxies for what is a good repeat what is a bad repeat so i built a bunch of that and i had a solution and i found something very interesting i cannot really share what it was but it was uh, to contrast to what had originally been being used in uh, pandora which really sparked my interest and uh, i met with a bunch of people like i met with scientists i met with product manager so i don't know how it is for every other company but for my company and i think a variant of it would be true for other companies is that we have a wiki page where everything all the documentation of all the projects so far has happened so i went there i put repetition and each and every one associated with repetition i set up one on one time with them and i met with them and uh what happened because of that was that i met a senior data scientist who was way above my area of work but he was happy to meet me and he was happy to talk about my solution and a happy outcome of that was that they actually changed the metric how repetition was used in pandora uh, and they put it to production and i was still an intern and my manager did not make me introduce me to that scientist or there was no formal way of making this happen the only reason it happened was because i actively talked to people because i wanted to understand better and learn better so this this i thought was really cool and i realized very fast that uh, as a product analyst um, your influence is like you build a you do a you have a problem you build a solution but how useful that solution is is in some extent dependent on how good the your solution is but it's also to a great extent that a lot of oversee is dependent on how strong is the network so that is where my motivations are coming from and that is where uh i strongly believe that it is really important but before talking more about how exactly everyone and anyone can approach it within within their company i wanted to tackle this question of what does it mean to be a product analyst now this is i am assuming our audience is mostly product analyst or aspiring product analyst or people who are uh, into who have been in product analyst for a lot of years uh and i think everyone has different definitions for it uh i went to school for data science so when i thought about product analyst to me it meant building machine learning solutions but being close to business and uh building machine learning solution and delivering it to business stakeholders that's how i saw it and uh, what i think a lot of people uh, define the difference between data science and product analyst is that product analyst you will be close to the product you will do ab ab experiments you will do reporting i have also heard people think product analyst is just a data analyst i've heard people say product analyst is just a business uh, intelligence kind of person who's just gathering reports so i've heard varying things about it and i think this is a important distinction to understand what it really is so in my experience this is what i think the ideal way to define a product analyst's work is so being a product analyst work 
to me, uh, in my experience, it's 20% strategy, 20% stakeholder relationship, 20% storytelling, and 40% analytics. So all the A-B experiment, building reports, doing R dashboards, or doing Python dashboards, or R notebooks, Python notebooks. Yes, it's a big chunk of our work, but I would say it's still 40% of our work, and there's 60% and are all of these other things um, that we easily oversee. And the influence and importance of your 40% analytics sort of comes from how good you are at those 60% other things. And today I'm going to be covering very high level uh, my thoughts as well as action items for each of these things. So first, I wanted to begin with strategy. Um, and before we get into strategy, I think it's important to understand the distinction uh, between reactive product analyst work and proactive product analyst work. Now, reactive product analyst work is anything that you're doing when you're reacting to a certain situation. That is, let's say coronavirus happened and you have a product and now a product manager wants you to tell them what is the effect of coronavirus on your product. So that is reactive or you had a marketing campaign and you have to report on what was the success uh, because of marketing campaign. So that again is a reactive product analyst work. When we talk about proactive product analyst work, it's more active in nature where let's say you are segmenting your customers. Uh, let's say you have ad revenue model and you're segmenting your customer for better ad targeting. Now that would be a proactive product analyst work because you are trying to actively and proactively uh, have better long-term results and make data-oriented choices. So it's very important to first understand what kind of product analyst are you? Are you a reactive product analyst? Are you a proactive product analyst? In my opinion and in my knowledge, no one is a 100% reactive product analyst and no one is a 100% proactive uh, product analyst. It's always a combination, uh, some ratio of both of those things. Uh, but I would advise that we should all, being product analysts, actively think about what this ratio should be and need to optimize on that. Uh, because I feel it's very easy to get carried over by only reactive work because there's no escape from reactive work. Things will happen and you'll have to react to it and you'll have to help people take decision when coronavirus comes up or when a marketing campaign happens. So you need to tell them what happened. Uh, but proactive work is also very important, especially for the long-term growth of a product. And uh, which is why you should define first for yourself what you think the ratio should be. Uh, people own product in a uh, different way. For example, in my company, we have a, a vertical setting where every product analyst own a product and different product analysts don't work with each other. They work with PMs, but it could be different for your company. So that is a good point to begin with. Now. Once you have thought about that, I would say the other action item would be you should talk to your stakeholders and I'll come uh, in a second about what these stakeholders are or what they should be or who they are. Uh, so you should talk to your stakeholders. It could be a manager, it could be a PM, whoever that is. So you need every quarter when you plan what you will be doing, which I think you should because there needs to be some planning that should be done before every quarter. You should commit to some hours for proactive product analyst work and um, that will give you certain authorized work hours just to work proactively. And as a product analyst, it is your role um, to tell the product manager that this is really important. So this is a chance and this is a way to do it. Uh, next, I think uh, other thing to also remember is that stakeholders, your product managers, uh, your the scientists that you work with, whoever you work with, they can tell you better about reactive work than they can about proactive opportunities. So you have to play a more active role in figuring out what these proactive opportunities need to be. Um, and I think being more proactive adds 
uh, a bigger value to the company long term. Although reactive work is very important, but a clear distinction should be made. Next, I wanted to talk about stakeholder relationship. Before getting into that, I wanted to stop a moment and think about what really are stakeholders. So stakeholders are anyone you work with, anyone who are your clients. Since we work in a product company, our clients are our product managers, engineers, scientists, and a lot of time people think product managers are the only stakeholder that are important to product analysts, but I would disagree. And I think depending on the structure of your company again, but I think uh, partnering up with engineers and partnering up with scientists is also critical for your success. And you should view them as your stakeholders. So the first step of stakeholder relationship is uh, identification. Uh, which is stage one. Um, so firstly, you should identify all stakeholders. And as I mentioned before, your stakeholders are not just your product managers. They're also the engineers. They're also the scientists uh, that you could potentially work with. So to give my example, for example, I work with podcasts. So for me, my stakeholders are uh, people in the product who are building new features related to podcasts. So they are my stakeholders and the content team in product is also my stakeholder. Um, and people who are creating new content, the uh, product managers for those are my stakeholders. Uh, in addition to that, uh, people, uh, the, uh, the product managers who are partnering up with uh, content, new content, third party content people are also my stakeholders. And Apart from that, uh, the scientists which are building recommendation system, uh, which are actually put to production, meaning the things that you actually see in the app uh, would also be my stakeholders because I can leverage that knowledge and do a business uh, and drive a business decision. And that may be out of the purview of work that the scientist does because the scientist, at least in my company, and that can heavily differ, but at least in my company, a scientist is one who drives production code, but, uh, and doesn't really need to translate that to business uh, needs, but I can be the center point between scientists and uh, leadership and drive those decisions. So identifying all stakeholders is important. Uh, identifying influential stakeholders is again important and this might not come immediately. This will probably take some time because as you spend more time in the company, uh, you will realize that who are the influential stakeholders and, and that can again be different because again, as I spoke about podcast, it's a multifaceted product. Every product decision is driven by a different people. So when I create a buy-in for a proactive uh, product analyst work, I need to know which stakeholder should I be talking to, which PM or which engineer or which, um, which scientist should I be talking to, to drive that. Um, next, uh, identifying peers is also important. So there are, I'm sure in all our companies, there are a lot of product analysts, but some product analysts will work in a product which is similar to yours. For example, mine is more content centric product. Uh, some people might have a more feature centric product. So depending on what your product is, uh, you should identify who in your team is more likely to have answers. Uh, and you can use them for peer review for anything that you build or for developing best practices, partnering up with peers is very important. There may be formal groups where people learn from each other, but even if they are not, you should take initiatives to make those groups. Now action to connect. Um, the way to go about this, there's no one right way to do it. This is how I do it. And this is how I think that should be the um, chronology of doing it is first, you should always introduce yourself and you should set up one-on-one -on -one time with all of these stakeholders when you start with the company or if you have ever always been in the company but you have not spoken one-on-one -on -one with a lot of stakeholders you should i encourage that you should do that and you should get to know what they really do again the your stakeholders are your clients and if you don't know what your clients are doing what problem they're solving 
you can't really give them a solution. So you need to know what problem they are solving and what are top priorities for them and what are their needs and wishes. You need to know that about everyone that you think is an important stakeholder. And this is the only way you can add value to them. Another thing that I've not mentioned here that I actively do is whenever I am added to a meeting, um, and it could be something related or unrelated, whenever I'm added to a meeting, I always make sure uh, I check up on who they are and what product division they work in and what exactly they do. Um, and I do that using an internal Pandora tool because we have this tool where you put uh, employee's name and you get all the details, but it could be different for your company. But before going in a meeting, if you know who you're gonna be talking to, um, that's going to add value and that's going to help you ask more relevant questions. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, the third thing, which I think is the most critical, is you need to maintain relationship with all these stakeholders. Uh, so uh, again, these are the things that have worked for me and there's no one right answer for it, but these are good places to start. So the first thing I think uh, we need to do is have data literacy. Uh, and provide uh, all the stakeholders with details on what you do and also build reporting cadence. Um, other than that, you, whenever you build a solution, for example, for me, I build a dashboard for the effect of uh, coronavirus on podcasts. I shared it widely with anyone and everyone remotely included with podcasts because they were all very curious to see that. And we live in a very data centric, uh, data influential world. If you see any kind of media reports in New York Times or any Washington Post or any place, you see that it's very data driven. Therefore, everyone's mindset has become more and more data driven. So the more data you provide them, the more they will feel confident in their choices and the more uh, the stronger relationship you have with them because they value data and you are closer to data. So uh, I think we should use that as a superpower now that we have it and uh, we should help with data literacy. And a lot of times people don't even ask you that, can you share that report with me? I think as a product analyst, it is your job to identify who all can potentially um, leverage from this work that you have done. And if you're not sure, just share it. And um, uh, coming back to my product analyst work that I did, like the podcast coronavirus work, I actually uh, heard back more from people who I didn't think or who didn't ask me for it, but they found it really so you should do that. Next, um, this is something that has worked for me. It may or may not work for you, depending on your project need or your company structure. Uh, but I have a lot of stakeholders that I work with, and I in particular have three PMs that I actively work with. So I have set up a bi-weekly meeting with all those stakeholders to discuss needs and wishes and bring them on the same page. Since um, my priority for each product and for product manager could be different. And this is a good way to bring them all on the same page and a healthy way to make them realize that if I'm not responding uh, very actively on a request, that's because I'm doing other things. And it's also a good place. Uh, as a product analyst, you're creating a space where all of these product managers that have a product in common, find similarities and um, use the work that you have already done in some other way in their particular field of work. So that's something I do. Uh, you can do a variation of it or whatever you feel works for you. The other thing is again, my solution for what I do and it could be different for you, but I use a Trello board uh, and I have two Trello boards currently. One where I list out uh, all the product, all the products that I need to monitor and all the projects that are high priority for me and I rank them and I set up timelines for it. And I have another Trello which is shared with all my stakeholders where they can like put requests, like if they want a particular data set or if they want some report or if they want a long-term project. 
um, it's just a good and this product and this board is available to all so they can also see what other people are doing so and i also uh, updated every few weeks so they know that what i'm up to uh, every week so this is something that has worked for me and honestly this can be an entire conversation on its own how to best use trello and which productivity tool to use but to in in summary you should explore productivity tools if you have not they are a really good tool to bring everyone on the same page now um wanted to share a story of course an anecdote uh, about how important storytelling is um as a product analyst the story i'm about to share is actually a non pandora story but i thought i would change gears and share another interesting anecdote from my life uh i when during my uh, during my time at northwestern i and one more person we participated in a humana maze healthcare competition which is a big healthcare competition and it was in three rounds and there were 100 teams participating and by the time of round 3 only five teams made it and what we were supposed to do is we were supposed to build a machine learning solution for predicting um, likelihood of opioid addiction by looking at an individual's health insurance history so for when when we were flown to houston to present our findings we built we did a very thorough analysis it had everything we uh, built a machine learning solution we uh, we thought about how to productionize it we also predict, we also built a front end machine learning solution for doctors to view Uh, a patient's history and also view in real time uh, what the likelihood of uh, individuals opioid addiction is we built all of these fancy stuff and we included all of that in our presentation and the other thing apart from all this analysis work that we included uh, in our presentation was that we started with the story about a person called Jane who has kids and who is 35 years old she has this life and she uh, gets opioid addicted and she loses her job she is uh, very suicidal now and all of those things and then we went into machine learning solution and then when we finally presented all the findings we uh, talked about um, how jane can leverage from this solution and if jane's doctor knew that she could potentially have a uh, uh, opioid addiction she, he would not have prescribed her opioids to begin with and that would have so, helped so many genes like that um and we were really happy about what we had presented uh but what came next was a little shocking so um after we had presented this uh, and we presented it to chief digital officer of humana and uh, when we went to her for feedback she said that the thing she liked most about our presentation was that how we personalize the opioid addiction problem and we introduce the character of Jane and uh, that is what she liked most about the presentation and honestly that took least amount of work and that would be the last thing i would think would be most important to leadership but apparently it was the most important thing to leadership of how we view that problem as a machine learning consultant and we ended up winning second prize in that competition and winning thousand dollars so that was really uh, a pivotal point where i realized that stories matter a lot especially when you are selling your machine learning solution or especially when you're talking about your machine learning solution because that's the only way for leadership to actually understand how the solution will actually be work and who will it actually impact so always include stories uh, when you are presenting your machine learning solution or any kind of metric update or always use use cases a lot of use cases so that is another uh, thing i wanted to highlight i wanted to end with this note uh, because i think it's this is what i've learned so far um so henry ford who built ford cars said if i had asked people what they wanted they would have said faster horses because they did not know cars could exist we are so much closer to data than product managers or leadership that sometimes we know that cars can exist 
but leadership doesn't know. So we need to be the people that tell them that when they tell us to build faster horses, we tell them, no, we can build cars and that's a better way to go ahead, which is why I want my, uh, I want all of us, the last takeaway from this slide to be that we are data, we have data superpower and it's a big, big superpower and we need to think about cars and not faster horses. Thank you. You can contact with me on LinkedIn or you can write me an email and that can open up for more questions because I talked a lot about a lot of things, but a lot of these things were open-ended and um, it could be different for your company. So feel free to ask me questions on what could work in the app, your scenario. So Tanya, thank you very much for your speech. It was quite interesting. And uh, I just start with my questions and then I continue with, co uh, with questions from Q&A session. So sure. my, uh, yeah, my, you have a great quote in the end of your presentation. And uh, just um, uh, if you like proactive analyst and you want to do research, for example, and you stakeholders like don't know, uh, know nothing about it, so uh, maybe you can give like some advice uh, how to do the job uh, to um, so this job will not be wasteful like so how can we manage to I don't know like to, to good right. uh, yeah, to good conclusions and to good insights how can we understand uh, that this will be valuable for our stakeholders right I agree that's a good question. I have faced that in my work experience that when I get asked to build something, but I am not sure if it will be useful or not. So I think the first step before you build anything, it could be a dashboard, it could be a report, it could be like anything, any analysis or customer segmentation or no matter what it is, before you actually go ahead and build it, you should at least develop some kind of documentation on what are your expectations from this particular thing that you're building and what are the use cases. Like, let's say you do a customer segmentation table, but if it is not directly usable, then all the work that you put into it will not be useful. So you, you want to consider use cases as to exactly which team and the, be, the more specific you can get about it, the better it is, like which team could potentially use it, like list out all the use cases and then go ahead and build something. Building and then thinking about how you can use it is I don't think a good way to do it. And then once you've identified that, okay, I'm building this thing for this team or this solution, go ahead and talk to them. Like, is this what you're thinking? Um, so a product analyst role is also a lot of talking that we don't, we don't recognize it as a role that has a lot of talking, but it actually does if you want to do it well. So I think that's all I have to say about that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, and one question from Pavel. Uh, on your opinion, what is the difference uh, between a product analyst and data scientist? So yeah, you have quite a lot, a big experience, so. Um, in my experience, so I went to school for data science and I am currently a product analyst and now, uh, and to do both of those things, I would say they're very broad. Uh, it could be very different for every company. For example, a product analyst could be a data scientist in other companies. Like in Facebook, I've heard that product analysts are called data scientists in product. Um, uh, you can be a data analyst and do what product analysts do. So the terms are very fluid, but if I talk about high level, what I have experienced in my past and how I distinguish between the two is, um, at least in Pandora, data scientists are the one that build production code. For example, if you're on a music streaming platform and you listen to A music, then which other music should they show you? Like B, C, D, E, which one? And all the production recommendation system are built by data scientists, whereas product analysts think more about which, uh, which feature makes sense, which kind of content makes sense. For example, for podcast, which kind of content works better in which kind of 
uh, demographic so all of those problems so i would think data science is more machine learning solution focused in production and focused in research whereas product analyst is someone who's closer to business who's constantly trying to optimize for more revenue better customer experience depending on your product field it could be more revenue it could be better experience like for example i'm constantly working towards optimizing metrics in like better uh, listening hours so that is what i'm optimizing on but every product analyst is doing it differently so when you look at a job posting or when you uh look at um uh, someone's title you should uh, you'll have to come talk to them because uh, for every company it looks different but this is what high level it would be yeah and uh, probably one last question from me uh when you did like a big research and you mentioned like machine learning algorithms and so on so how not to dig deep into research and spend like a lot of time on it and uh, like the question where to stop how much uh, time do you usually spend on this or <laughs> maybe you can tell us i i think again it's a very subjective question it really depends on what your timeline is uh, there's a popular quote that says that work takes the work expands and takes the amount of time you have so you should really set a, this is what works for me and it may or may not work for you but i always set timelines so let's say it's a eight week project so i will give two weeks for planning and talking to all the stakeholders give another five weeks for actually building the model and the last one week for actually uh, compiling all my findings documenting everything and this is for a machine learning solution for a product analyst solution i need to talk more to product, to other stakeholders so it could look, look different but before starting any projects i think you should answer how much time do i have and what are the tasks that i need to do to achieve this and uh, set up a formal timeline for what should have been done by week 1 week 2 week 3 instead of having an open timeline of i will take as much time as it takes so having a fixed timeline and you could be a little flexible with that but um, still following it to some extent would really help does it answer your question yeah yeah thank you maybe i'm just curious maybe can you tell us more about uh, just a little bit <laughs> what tools do you use uh, for a job when you as a product analyst Uh, at Pandora, in particular, I use uh, a lot of Presto, a lot of Hadoop. Uh, uh, sometimes I use Python, but I didn't say it's a lot. It would be thirty percent. I use all the Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google <laughs> Presentation stuff. So, uh, data science tool would be Presto, uh, Hadoop, and Python. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Just to end this presentation with uh, the most like raised question. So thank you very much. It was very interesting. And uh, now seeing that it's the end, and uh, probably I can give a word to Anita, our host, and uh, she will end this. <laughs> Uh, hi, one more time. Uh, thank you to each and everyone for joining our YouTube live. We've had uh, 170 people listening to us uh, online. That's really cool. And we appreciate you spending some time and coming to our event. Uh, that's very exciting. Uh, one more time, I urge you to fill in our feedback forum so we can make our future events even better. Or if you want to have some updates from Rack Tech Club, you can also leave your contact information there and we'll make sure that each and every newsletter will reach you. Uh, so the feedback forum uh, will be uh, shown on the slide for maybe five minutes after the YouTube live ended and there is also a link to the feedback form in the description to this youtube live uh, and for now uh, for those of you who want to proceed with uh, talking with pro about product analytics insights uh, data anything you want uh, we'll post a link to our uh, secret club of networking uh, unfortunately we can only host uh, 50 people there but if you're the one who's bored in uh, 
in isolation and want to have some live talks about product analytics, please join this link. All you have to do is just type in your name. We'll be having three rooms in this um, interface. Uh, there will be three pictures of speakers. And the closer you get to the speaker, the louder the uh, voice uh, can be. So if you're uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to come up to a person inside this app and we'll make sure we'll tell you the details on how this platform works. Uh, you can ask any questions to our speakers over there. You can ask questions about Rike. You can chat with each other. It's just a fun thing to do. So I'll see you at the networking session. And one more time, please fill in the feedback form. Thank you so much for coming and uh, I shall see you guys in our next events. Thank you.